My Vote Mackinac tonight is brought to you by ITC Holdings Corp, the Masco Corporation Foundation, DTE Energy Foundation, EVS Chemicals, World Asset Management, a Comerica company, Raymond, and by the Shirley and Bill Fox Fund. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald and welcome to Detroit Public TV's 2014 coverage of the Mackinac Policy Conference from the Grand Hotel. Business leaders, politicians, foundation leaders and educators all meet every year on Mackinac Island to talk about the state's future. The Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island is the hub for the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference. 2014 marks the 34th year. More than 1,500 of Michigan's top business professionals, government leaders, entrepreneurs, and concerned citizens will gather on the island to share ideas to move Michigan forward. The themes for this year's conference, entrepreneurship, STEM education, a focus on science, technology, engineering, and math and impact. Making Michigan a globally competitive state and a globally competitive environment for Michigan uh, uh, families, Michigan employees, so that we can drive, drive the state forward. But that drive will mean traveling through the city of Detroit's bankruptcy, the largest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history. Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan and Emergency Manager Kevin Orr will take center stage at the conference to discuss putting the city on a long-term path of sustainability. And the mood of the people living across the state indicates Michigan is moving in the right direction. You will hear people say that they're, they've never been more optimistic about Michigan's future than they are now. And there's data to back that up. If you look at what their hiring plans are, it's positive. When you look at what their attitude is, it's positive. When you look at what they think of state policy, it's positive. Positive with good reason. The state is enjoying a budget surplus and the unemployment rate continues to drop. But this is also an election year, and many of Michigan's longtime and influential lawmakers, Senator Carl Levin, Congressman Mike Rogers, Dave Camp, and John Dingell, have called it quits. CNN political commentators Paul Begala and S.E. Cup will bring their opinions and debate the midterm elections. Another hot topic, the future of education. We have a challenge in this state. There's tens of thousands of jobs that are available um, that can't be filled because um, the workforce doesn't have the proper training and skills to fill those jobs. Gallup CEO Jim Clifton, best-selling author Malcolm Gladwell, and Joel Klein, the former chancellor of the New York City Department of Education, will offer their insight. There will also be panels on entrepreneurship, the opportunities and the challenges, as well as technology and the future of the auto industry. Perhaps one of the more unique sessions, a Veterans Talent Showcase, designed to help those who served our country find jobs in the private sector. It's very important that this conference is not just about having a conversation and then having it kind of float away. When I leave the island, I've always got a lot, of, a lot of thoughts going through my head about different topics and, and different themes and, and different issues that people bring to the table. There is a lot to get to tonight, including the business climate in the state. So coming up tonight, you're going to hear what the governor has to say about the state's minimum wage. He signed the bill this week, increasing the wage to 925 by 2018. Also coming up, the race for U.S. Senator Carl Levin's seat took the main stage today with Democratic Congressman Gary Peters and former Secretary of State Terry Lynn Land. And finally, the city of Detroit. What happens to the city impacts the entire health of the state. You will hear from Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan. But first, we get to our roundtable tonight. Tonight, Nancy Kaffer of the Detroit Free Press, Craig Folly of WDET Radio, and Nolan Finley of the Detroit News. It's great to see all of you up here on Mackinac Island, and there are no shortage of things to talk about. So let's jump right in. I'm going to start with you, Nancy. What are the two points that you would tell people that you're going to take out of this conference or two things to really look for? Um, you know, support for Detroit has come through loud and clear. The governor has been very clear about it. The bills just passed the state legislature. This is a very, uh, I'm sorry, the state uh, house. The state house. Um, you know, expected to pass the Senate, be signed by the governor. This is very good news. Um, also, this focus on education uh, is good. It needs to get more serious with regard to improving Detroit public schools, the largest district in the state, and uh, implementation of the Common Core and its associated Test Smarter Balance. But those are the things I'm looking at. All right, Craig, what are you uh, what are you following? 
Well, obviously, I'm following the political races pretty closely because it is an election year here in Michigan. We got a gubernatorial contest, a Senate race, and, and of course, the State House uh, is potentially up for grabs here. So there's a lot of politicians up here that are trying to get out the message about what it is they're going to do if indeed they are elected. And I mean, there's so much movement in Congress in particular. There are a ton of candidates up here that I haven't had a chance to talk to. So that's I'm going to spend a lot of time working on that. But also to see the opinion about uh, Detroit's future coalescing here and, and the need to do something is pretty impressive so far. I have a feeling we're going to hear that throughout the, throughout the whole conference. All right, Nolan, what is your what is your vibe here, I guess? Well, there's a lot of work going on on a transportation bill, trying to find the money for roads. And there's a, a good deal of confidence, particularly amongst the governor's staff, that they're going to get some sort of deal made over the next couple of days, if not very quickly, when they get back to Lansing. They feel they have a bipartisan coalition of Democrats and Republican votes that could get a revenue hike passed, a tax hike passed. So there's that. I think that's the number one priority um, up here this week. And then I'm watching the county executives race. It's wide open. Nobody has emerged as the sort of consensus leader. A lot of people are holding back their endorsements still. UAW still has not endorsed in that race. Wow, and there's a lot of candidates in that field, Craig. Well, and, and there's not a lot of confidence amongst any of the candidates about what the numbers in the polling show at this point in time. So normally, in a race like this, somebody would sit there and say, we're in a great position. Nobody's really in a great position, certainly not the county executive at this point in time, Bob Ficano. And, you know, you talk to some of the people around that campaign, they're concerned. Nancy? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of folks on that ballot, the two best known being Bob Vacano and uh, former sheriff and former DPD chief uh, Warren Evans. Um, but when voters see a lot of choices, they sometimes get confused and go with the familiar, which gives Evans and Ficano both an advantage. Um, but yeah, no one is really dominating this race so far. One thing I want to talk about is the minimum wage and the fact that the, that just passed and the governor signed that. For people at home who have been watching, this seemed to come in very quickly and move very quickly. Nancy, what should people be taking away from this and how does this really put Michigan uh, on the map in terms of a business climate now? Well, it's a good jump, but it's not the jump that Obama had uh, kind of kind of called for. It's it's. It's a, it's a full, uh, almost a full dollar less than what the petition drive had been trying to get. Um, but it's still a good hike for the minimum wage. However, it's also a detriment to Democratic gubernatorial candidate Mark Schauer, who was going to use Michigan wage and worker fairness issues as a big uh, sort of club during this campaign against Governor Snyder. This kind of takes that off the table. This is done. The governor signed it. Minimum wage has been increased. Where does he go with that? And it's really tough to be against this. I mean, you can be really, really opposed to the way that Randy Richerville brought this up to circumvent the ballot initiative on the minimum wage. Very savvy political move to take an issue that might get people out to the polls to get that off the ballot. Um, and if you're a Democrat, you can be really opposed to that, but recognize you just got an almost $2 increase in the minimum wage. If you, if you sit there and oppose that, you've got a real problem. Was this good policy, Nolan? No, it was panic policy making. <laughs> they adopted bad policy to keep from having worse policy. I think they got bluffed into this. I'm not sure that ballot petition had the resources to, one, get the signatures, but two, to mount a uh, ballot campaign. The unions in this state, their campaign funds are depleted. They're spread thin. If you're a small business person, I talked to some of the small business lobbyists up here today. They're the second. They're they're furious because they're the ones that are going to have to pay this bill. And the the thing that worries them about this bill is it's indexed to inflation. So they have no ability if if their profits go down to control labor costs other than laying off workers. This is going to lead to higher unemployment. Last word on this, Craig. But there is a cap on what that rate of inflation will be that it can't go above. So there are some protections built into this. Well, I did uh, sit down with just a short time ago with Governor Snyder. We talked about minimum wage. We also talked about education and business in the state. Take a look. Just this week, you signed the minimum wage bill, yeah. um, which people are saying is a victory for working families. You have some skeptics that are saying, well, that was an end run to stop a ballot proposal in an election year. How would you respond to that? It was a bipartisan compromise. It was Democrats and Republicans from both chambers coming together to say, here's a solution that helps raise wages for those people in those positions, and at the same time, does it in a more measured and thoughtful fashion with some protections to say hopefully it doesn't adversely affect job creators. I was just going to say, how do you think that makes Michigan look? 
to the rest of the country. I think it looks like we know how to work together. Because again, it was a bipartisan compromise. I think Washington could use a few of those. I think they could too. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit, speaking of compromise, about the grand bargain. We know the yeah. House moved on it, the Senate has to take this up. Do you think the Senate has the votes for it? And what has this process been like? Well, this is another exercise in great bipartisanship. If you looked at the House vote, it had strong bi bi bipartisan support. Actually, the vote count was higher than many people thought it would be. So hopefully that sets up the Senate to follow on that path, to say there, if the conditions are very similar, and hopefully they'll make a similar review and vote the same way. Have things been going in Detroit the way that you thought they would through this bankruptcy process? Largely, yes. This, is, this has been one of the largest problems in the United States, and it's a solution to 60 years of problems. So this is extremely difficult stuff, but if you go back and look, in the spring of last year, when I authorized the bankruptcy, we set a rough timetable for how we hoped things would proceed. We were within about two weeks of that timetable. And at that time, I don't think many people believed that was really possible. So we've been very consistent. There are still challenges to go. I don't take this, assume this is done, but we have an opportunity by the fall to have a constructive resolution, a settled process here that really says now all parties, instead of talking about the decline of Detroit, can talk about growing Detroit. That's tremendously powerful. And don't we want a situation where we're talking about the growth of Detroit, Michigan? I think That's a lot exciting. Of, I think a lot of people would like to see that, but there are also a lot of cities, municipalities around the state that are watching this very carefully, as you very well yeah. know. There's a lot of them that are in financial crisis themselves or moving towards that yeah. way. Do you think with this grand bargain, you've set up some kind of precedent where these other cities are going to say, where's our money? from the legislature no, to bail No, I don't us take out. it that way. Each case is individualized. And if you look at, people have been talking about this massive problem for a number of years. There is a serious problem there we have with our municipalities and units of government. But if you look at the number of communities actually in emergency manager status really hasn't changed. We've actually had some move out of that status, a few others. We're still talking a handful of communities with emergency managers or consent agreements out of over 2,000 jurisdictions. We do need to do more work, though, and that's why I've called for legislation to do a better early warning system to say how can we work with communities to better address this long term and work our way out of it. So a lot of those conversations you think are going to be happening this summer, maybe some new ideas of how to deal with this? Well, again, more on the early warning front on how to help communities look farther out and to give more transparency and information to the citizens. Because in many cases, I'm not sure all our citizens have the information on their local jurisdictions to know how underfunded they are or what these challenges are. And hopefully they can speak up and encourage their leaders to do more to solve the problem. I want to talk a little bit about education. There is a bill in the House right now that would move the standardized testing to the oversight to the Treasury Department. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I didn't call for that at all. That's The legislators are looking at that, and I think it shows that there's a challenge point. I think there's an issue between potentially the, the Board of Education and the legislature or the department and the legislature that I hope they can work through those issues. And again, I'm ha happy to help facilitate it to say how we can make sure we're working well together. What do you tell a parent or a family who has children in public schools in Michigan? What do you tell them about the future of Michigan's education program? Well, I hope there's a bright future. Again, that's what we're all working towards. Um, we're taking care of some structural problems that have been there for decades in terms of we had an underfunded retirement system there. Um, we're solving that, that we have another year where we need to make a significant investment, but then we're on a path um, to making sure it's sustainable long term, which hopefully helps teachers and people working in the system. We're focusing on student growth. That should be always the top priority, not just having the student go to class, but measuring the growth of students. And I think that's really exciting. So longer term, I would say there's an exciting future. We still have some challenges to work through. Let's take a look now at the U.S. Senate race. Both candidates, Congressman Gary Peters and Terry Lindland, spoke today. New polls out give Gary Peters a pretty good lead, 44 to 38 percent, with 18 percent undecided. There has been another poll from the Detroit News, which sharp, which really brings in that margin, only between about 4 percent. So this really isn't, this race isn't going anywhere, any, any, you know, anytime fast. But Nancy, let me tell you, let me ask you, how important is this kind of forum for both Terry Lynn Land and Gary Peters to impress the business people here on the island? Well, unfortunately, this wasn't a terribly impressive forum. Um, the candidates didn't debate. They spoke separately. They took questions from the audience. Um, I mean, in theory, they're trying to impress not just potential voters, but the folks who make campaign donations. And this was not really a format, I think, in which either one of them really showed to advantage. Um, 
uh, it, it was a strange situation. They were never on the stage together. They passed each other coming in and out. They didn't really even acknowledge each other, though I'm told they shook hands prior to the event. It was a, it was a weird setup. I'm not sure how much that's going to have moved the needle for any of them with anyone who didn't already support them. Perhaps maybe not the forum in itself, and it was never billed as a, as a debate. No, it, it wasn't, but at the same time, it, it was a complete disappointment uh, because you have Gary Peters making, what, a seven-minute statement and then taking a couple of questions from the audience and then getting grief for taking too long to answer the questions. Uh, and Terry Lynn Land used her, her 15 minutes, and, and, and that was it. I mean, we didn't learn anything new about these candidates today. They didn't get a chance to really address any of the criticisms that have come their way from each other. There needs to be a free-flowing discussion between these two at some point in time. Because this campaign, if we're not careful, is going to slide into the territory where it's entirely defined by the advertising that's being paid for by groups from out of state. This has got to change quickly or else voters are going to be shortchanged. Do you believe that that could happen, Nolan? Well, it's already happened and it's going to happen no matter what they do. This is going to be a $50 million race with about 40 million of it coming from special interest groups on both sides. This event today and their appearance on the island was, as Nancy said, it was fundraising. Not just that event, but all the work they're doing um, you know, in side rooms and meetings with people. And it's also lobbying the chamber for its endorsement. The, the local chamber has not endorsed in that race yet, and I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. And that's a pretty important endorsement in this race. When can they expect some kind of endorsement? I don't know. <laughs> uh, how much, how you're much, sitting on the sidelines right now, too, waiting to see maybe which way, which way things break. How much stock do you put in numbers this early on in a race like this, Nancy? You know, it's both the polls done by the Free Press and the News. Uh, they're, they're not, the gaps that we're showing are not insurmountable. So even if these numbers are absolutely solid, take them to the bank, it's not a done deal by any means. You still look, well, you got 18% undecided. undecided. So what I'm looking at is you've got a very long summer of each of these candidates really having to show to the rest of the state. Because again, we might be very familiar with Gary Peters if you're from Southeast Michigan, if you're from the west side of the state, Terry Lynn Land, but they have to make sure that they are getting to all more. Uh, Christy, what you're seeing? So this is going to hang this on. going to stretch to November. Yeah. Well, what yeah. you're seeing in this race right now in these polls, you're mostly seeing the Democratic vote going with Gary. The Republican going with Terry Lynn, and the independents still haven't made up their mind. So you get a few, a little movement amongst the undecided, the independent voters, but so far you haven't seen a surge for either candidate. And the key thing is, will those independents, undecided, show up in November? Will well, they feel compelled and, and to? And they won't even pay attention till September, so you could be wasting a whole lot of money till then. And when you say 50 million 50 for a million. race, that to me is staggering. It's amazing. All right, let's turn our focus now to Detroit and its future coming out of bankruptcy. Also a big focus of the conference today. Today, Mayor Mike Duggan gave his keynote address talking about the recent successes and the way to move the city forward. Side lot programs in our head, uh, but I would say sometime in the month of June, we're going to take some of the neighborhoods where we're doing the demolitions and we're going to do just what we do in everything else. We're going to hang them on some neighborhoods. We're going to work out the bugs. We're going to have a, a website that you can go on, fill in your information showing that you're the next door neighbor, uh, put a $100 charge on your credit card, and then come down to the office at a scheduled time and pick up your deed. There's a lot of kids in our city who feel like they've been forgotten, who feel like the community has discarded them. How powerful a statement would it be if hundreds of companies came together and said, we believe in you, we believe in your potential. So he was talking about neighborhoods and he was talking about job opportunities for young people. Um, it was the most packed session of the day. There was standing room only. People were very interested in what Mike Duggan had to say and really coming out as his first policy conference as mayor of the city of Detroit. How did he do, Nancy? You know, he clearly enjoys the job, which is a kind of a marked contrast from his, uh, his predecessor, uh, Mayor Dave Bing, whose attitude was always, this is kind of a horrible job and it's not fun. Duggan really seems to enjoy this work and I think it's just, it's the, the job is too hard if you don't love it. I mean, he's got a lot of ideas. He's got a lot of energy. He seems to be doing a decent job of attaching funding to his ideas, which is the big stumper for almost everyone. Um, so far, I'm cautiously optimistic. 
He spent a lot of time talking about neighborhoods, Craig, which I think was very refreshing given the amount of time and the headlines that have been focused on downtown and downtown redevelopment and business development. Well, and, and this was one of the criticisms of Mike Duggan before he really got into this race. There were a lot of people that were concerned. Is he going to be a guy that just caters to the downtown midtown crowd and the business crowd to get the money he needs for pet projects? He came out swinging from day one and said, you know what, I care about the people who live in the city and I want to make their lives better. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be too much to ask a mayor to have a sense of enthusiasm about his job and what he can accomplish in that job. Over promise, deliver on a few and he'll be okay. But I think people in the city are just excited to have somebody who's excited about what he can do to actually help them. I think he did a good job today. And did he deliver today, Nolan? Well, you know, this is an easy crowd. This crowd up here loves him the way they love well, they almost, Rick they Snyder want him four succeed, years ago. Right. Like. <laughs> they have the same sort of faith in him that they had in Rick when he was a, his first Mackinac conference. It's sort of a celebration of Mike Duggan. So, you know, he, he doesn't have to win them over. He just has to keep them on board. And I think he's done a good job of keeping them excited about what's going on in the city. And, and don't forget, I mean, a lot of this, too, there were a lot of numbers thrown out in that speech today. And who is one person that really thrives on numbers and metrics? Governor Snyder. He's making as much a pitch about, hey, look, Kevin Orr's not going to be here forever. I can handle this if you want to put this in my lap. We can get us through this. I think there was a little bit of that in the speech today. So a, a little bit of auditioning for the job that he already ran for and won. Yes. I think definitely that that's part of his goal is to show that he can be trusted with the city. But he also um, he also always brings us back around to a specific ask. Um, over the winter, he was when he spoke to various business groups, he was asking them to support various scrap metal bills that were moving through Lansing. Today, he asked businesses to support his summer uh, youth employment program. I mean, he's he's very aware of who he's talking to, and he's giving them this big picture of what he wants to do. But he also knows what he's going to ask people for. It's it's a very uh, well calibrated speech that he gives, and it'll be interesting to see what kind of fruit that bears. Well, and, and I love it. I love this idea. Instead. Of just sitting there and clapping when you say, oh, yes, we need to do something about the kids. He says, oh, by the way, here's a form, and you can uh, leave your money at the door on the way out. That's pretty significant, I and mean, he's calling people to action, which it's been a long time since we had a mayor competitively. I mean, do so in a compelling way. I think it's also interesting, too, Nolan, that he is, is taking ownership of the things that he actually does have control of, because, again, police, we're looking at, that he does not have the oversight of that yet. No, but you know, from the beginning, he has been itching to have his hands on everything, and you know, he, he keeps pushing the limits, and you know, that's natural, given his personality and you know, what he wants to do. I think he feels a little uh, constrained by the emergency manager, that, you know, and he just can't wait for the day when he can push ahead with his full agenda. I want to come back to I don't think it's it's possible to overstate how important it is for businesses to sign on for this kind of summer program probably three years ago when I was a reporter at a, a different publication I wrote an article about a summer youth employment program for the three years after that I would get phone calls from kids who had googled Detroit summer jobs and had gotten my number asking where they could find summer work this is a huge need heartbreaking to have to tell kids who call you that you can't help them with their quest for to be gainfully employed over the summer this is a huge need and if you can pull this off it's going to be great for the community bigger picture let's take a look at how Detroit is being perceived at this conference because we said at the top of the show that what's happening in Detroit is of of main focus Nolan I'm going to start with you how do you think Detroit is is looking well we had a poll out this week that uh, really shows a huge shift in my mind um, in every region of the state support for the, the bailout of Detroit uh, was in the majority confidence in the city's future was in the majority I don't think you could have five years ago even gotten through the legislature a rescue package for Detroit I think this this shift in attitudes about Detroit's been remarkable. It's as if adversity unites us. 30 seconds left, Craig, well, and then I'll there, go to Nancy. There is still some potential peril in the state Senate, though. Uh, this is not a done deal yet. They still have a little work to do there. Nancy, it's, last word. It's not a done deal, but it is great to see the conventional wisdom that the rest of the state hates Detroit kind of turned on its ear by this recent polling that shows that the rest of the state does, in fact, support Detroit and understands how important it is to the state's future. All right, our thanks to our roundtable, Nolan Finley, Craig Folley, Nancy Caffer. We so appreciate it. You know, finally tonight, we couldn't visit one of Michigan's most popular places without the crew that makes a living touring the state. So the guys from Under the Radar are going to introduce us to the finer points of fudge.
Hey, it's Tom from Under the Radar, Michigan. You know, during the policy conference, a lot of very important decisions are made, and things can get a little intense. But for me, there's really only one decision to make. Nuts or no nuts? Mackinac Island has been turning regular tourists into fudgies for over a century. It's an age-old tradition that's being kept alive by mainstays like Murdoch's. Bob Benser Jr. is in charge of all things fudge here. How long has your family been making fudge? Uh, 55 years. My dad uh, came up 55 years ago from Gaylord, Michigan, and um, he got to know Mr. Murdoch really well, and Mr. Murdoch went to retire, and um, liked my dad a lot, so he sold the business to uh, yeah. my father, and then he's expanded it from there. We, this was the original? This is the original store, yep. Yeah, the original recipes, original store. Dating back to? 1887. Same year the Grand Hotel was founded, so 126 years ago. We celebrated our 125th. So you're continuing tradition. Yeah, very much so, yeah. And I've used to make, you know, when I was a little kid, I started in the fudge stores when I was 13 years old, and I don't make so much anymore, but uh, I still enjoy it. I have a piece of fudge every day. Kids will tell you, I come by and <laughs> always have double chocolate's my favorite, so. Well, you know me, I usually try not to fudge things up too much, but this time, it was okay. Oh my gosh! It's like 240 degrees. Do you need a Michigan taster? Because I'm from Michigan. I'll mean, yeah. <laughs> be an authentic one. Michigan taster. How old is the art of making fudge anyway? 1887. This is the original store. and Oh, this store here is the original? Yep, same way as uh, they did back in 1887. Oh my gosh. Why are we leaving it? That looks so, so it's good. So you're Ricardo? Yes. Are you are, are you like a fourth degree uh, fudge expert? Oh, maybe. What's the most rewarding thing about making fudge? Watching people go, mmm. <laughs> Everybody go, mmm. <laughs> you're right, that was fun. So whether you're nuts or no nuts, you'd be nuts not to pick up some fudge before you leave Mackinac Island. After all, it's just good policy. Get it? Good policy? Good boy. <laughs> Sounds great, guys. And that'll do it for My Vote Mackinac. Join us tomorrow night as we continue to cover this year's Mackinac Policy Conference for all of us at Detroit Public TV. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.